Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Central Library. I'm Barbara Gartner, a member of the Des Moines Public Library Foundation Board. And I'm glad to see all of you here, in spite of all the street closings in preparation for arts here, art fair this weekend. I'd like to remind you to turn off cell phones and ask that you please complete an evaluation form before you leave today. After the presentation, there will be a brief question and answer session. We ask that you write down your questions on the paper provided and pass it to the end of the row at the specified time. The Des Moines Public Library Foundation is proud to support this program, which is a celebration of the written word, the authors who write, and all who love to read. We would like to give special thanks to our other sponsors of this year's AVID series. Humanities Iowa, Nationwide, Wells Fargo, Deborah and Douglas West, the Des Moines Arts Center, Hoyt Sherman Place Theater, the Forest Avenue Brick Fund, the Drake University Center for Global Citizenship, the Iowa Council for International Understanding, and the Iowa History Center at Simpson College. I would also like to thank tonight's volunteers, Mary and Bill Dunbar and Frank Selsey. Following the presentations, Lisa's book can be purchased at the front uh, through the courtesy of Barnes & Noble. She will remain for signings outside of this meeting room. A percentage of the sales is given back to the foundation for its support of the library programs. Avid t-shirts also are available for $10 each and can be purchased after the program. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's program, Cindy Shen. I just, sorry, go ahead, thank you. <laughs> I had a chance to visit with Cindy just before uh, I stood up here and learned a little bit about her, her background. She moved to Storm Lake in 1985 from Taiwan to teach Chinese at Buena Vista. Uh, there she met and married her husband Frank in 1987. They moved to Sioux City in 91 and taught, she taught math in the community college there. Uh, they moved to Des Moines in 1999. Cindy is an advocate for the Asian and Pacific Islander Iowans. Volunteering is her great joy in life. Her personal motto is, live one day at a time and make it a masterpiece. She has lived a varied life, moving between many different employment and volunteer opportunities. Some of her past job titles and roles include data analyst, database and finance manager, professor of mathematics, statistics, and Chinese, oops, gotta flip the page, Chinese language, con consultanating and administrators with data and issues of Asian and Pacific Islanders in Iowa, and Division Administrator for the Office of the Status of Islands of Asian and Pacific Island Heritage. Shen has also worked in many volunteer organizations attempting to help those less fortunate. She has worked with orphans, low-income students, and refugees in Thailand and Cambodia. Cindy and her husband, Dr. Frank Affinato, a retired college professor, have adopted many families and strangers. Their home has been referred to as an international boarding house. Throughout her career, Cindy has received many awards and honors, including Governor's Golden Dome Employees Award, Lieutenant Governor's Volunteer Award, Admir Asian Volunteer Award, and Iowan, Iowa Governor's Volunteer Award. However, no award can equal the satisfaction she receives with, when helping someone in need. Please join me in welcoming Cindy Shen. Thank you, Barb. Can you hear me? Yeah, the first thing is that before I started that, remember this is an evaluation on one side and uh, you can write down your questions in the back and then pass on to the end of IOS. Uh, library staff and volunteers will pick them up and then we will go through the questions when we have enough time. And uh, good evening, I'm Cindy Chen, and really it's an honor to have an opportunity to introduce the Lisa C to you. And uh, Lisa, besides the, the Shanghai Girls you can purchase here, she also has written uh, Peony in Love, Snow Flowers, and a Secret Fan, Dragon Bones, The Interior, Flower Net, and uh, On Golden Mountain. And I love uh, not only Shanghai Girls, I also love the book of uh, On Golden Mountain. Go On Golden Mountain actually is a memoir covering more than a century of uh, Mrs. C's family, both uh, Chinese side and the uh, Caucasian side. It's like a Shanghai Girls tell the story of the class differences that both uh, 
uh, in China and the United States, which was called the uh, United States. It's called it. It was called called Golden Mountains uh, by the Chinese. And Shanghai girls, well, fiction, but it could just as easily be true. She described about a girl's mother with bound foot, bound uh, bound feet, and I do have friends, old friends, with bound foot. Even my own mother, when she was five, she, her family started bound her feet, and she rebelled. So my mother, you could see it is smaller. Her feet were smaller than regular feet, and uh, so it's not too far away. I mean, it's just one generation away. And then she also described the the uh, girl's family and the girl's husband's family. They were uh, rather wealthy compared with the, the poverty of the masses in China. And the pro then later on, the girls. Uh, would experience that in the United States. And then also the dis discriminations they encountered in the United States. And uh, as you know, as an immigrant to the United States, uh, and also working with many immigrants, and uh, is, uh, is still existing here. And uh, also, the, she also described the changes uh, that World War II has made to uh, the China. Chinese and China and the United States, such as the Exclusion Act, finally, eventually, was reappealed in 1930s. And during World War II, many of the Chinese Americans or Chinese immigrants served in the militaries in the service, and later on, they had opportunity to, to become U.S. citizens. Again, that's not too long ago. And she also described the, the communists that take over China and so on. And what she wrote, almost as one who has lived through it herself. And I don't know how she did it. And uh, so, it's my pleasure to present you, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Lisa C. Thank you very much. Now, do you hear me okay with this? Yes, okay. So um, I just wanted to say, I know later you write questions on cards. Many of you probably haven't read Shanghai Girls, so if you have questions about the previous books, please feel free to ask them. I'm here to answer any question. If you've heard me before, you know that I like to talk about stories that have been lost, forgotten, or deliberately covered up that I also like to talk about family, and I'm not going to stray too far from that tonight, but I just realized something. You could never have heard me before, because I have never been to Des Moines before. <laughs> I've never even been in the state before. So. Okay, so forget what I just said. Uh, writers are often told when they're first starting out, write what you know. Well, when I first start writing a book, there are a lot of things I don't know. When I started on Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I knew a little bit about the secret language, but not enough to write a book. When I started on Peony and Love, I had heard about the lovesick maidens. I had heard about the this you know passion for the Peony Pavilion, but that was about it. Going way back in time uh, with. FlowerNet, I had heard about the global trade in bear bile used for Chinese herbal medicine, but truly that was all I knew. What I do is I go to China and I do a lot of research. I spend a lot of time in this country with academics and scholars from all over the country who I just get to pick their brains about their life's work. I live very close to UCLA in Los Angeles and I spend a lot of time in the research library reading people's published and unpublished dissertations, things even their mothers wouldn't read. <laughs> I also am a real pest, and I, if, you know, if I, if you ever say, Lisa, please come over, you think twice, because I will sit on your couch, and I will just sit there until you tell me your life story, uh, and then pretty soon we're going through your attic and basement and garage <laughs> and closet, and sometimes even to, into the trunks of your car, and pretty soon there comes this day when I can say, oh yes, you know, now I know enough that I can sit down and start working on this novel. 
Uh, so what I wanted to do tonight was, uh, well, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So uh, that's all the sort of history, right? And I, I think a lot of people look at my books and think, oh, yes, they're really about history, and there's all this history, and you learn so much. But to me, what my books are actually about are relationships and emotions. I know a lot about mothers and daughters. I know a lot about husbands and wives. I know a lot about friends and friendship because I've experienced those relationships myself just as all of you have. I know a lot about love and hate and envy and jealousy and remorse and guilt. I'm very good at the negative ones, I must say. <laughs> I think I have to start working, you know, for another book. Maybe it'll be a couple away from here on the ones that would have, you know, happiness and joy and ecstasy, and, but I'm working on it, okay? So I know a lot about those emotions because I've experienced them myself, just as all of you have experienced them. So what I wanted to do tonight was tell you a little bit about the plot of Shanghai Girls, then go back into that history that sort of gives it its foundation, and then go a little deeper to the, um, the relationships and the emotions. So here's the plot in Shanghai Girls. Two sisters leave Shanghai in 1937 and go to Los Angeles Chinatown in arranged marriages. That's it. <laughs> This is the first book that I've written that I can say in the, the plot in one sentence. I have now been on book tour going to a city a day for five weeks, so you just don't know how nice it is to be able to say it in one sentence. <laughs> All right, so let's take it from the top. Two girls leave Shanghai in 1937. Well, Shanghai in 1937 was the Paris of Asia. It was a city of great contrast and great diversity. You had great, just tremendous poverty, beggars and rickshaw pullers on one end, and then this vast, vast, enormous wealth, mercantile wealth, banking wealth, and everything in between. Shanghai was a place that people had come from all over the world to be there. You had Russians, white Russians, who had escaped out of Russia during the revolution and had found a safe haven in Shanghai. 1937, you saw the very first big wave of Jews out of Germany who had had a sense like, oh, something bad's coming, we're getting out. And they also found a safe, at least temporarily, safe haven in Shanghai. You had the French concession that had been settled by the French. The British were there, of course, and they felt that they were running everything, and in many ways they were, but you could also argue that it was actually the gangsters who were running things. There were the Chinese, and then one other category of people. You know, usually when you go someplace, you travel to a foreign country, and you're going to start this new life, and you think you're going to make fame and fortune, this was not this category. There was a whole category of people who just went to Shanghai for the vice. They just, whatever bad thing you could possibly imagine that you could do in the world, they had it right there in Shanghai. So people would come down off the gangplank, step off the, the you know, boat, and then just like right down into the pit of degradation. They just, that was, that was for them. So you can see just a little bit of everyone in Shanghai. And this was this final, final moment before things really started to change. In mid-1937, the Japanese invaded. The Sino-Japanese War kind of rolled right into World War II. As soon as World War II was over, civil war, and in 1949, Mao took over the country. And Mao looked at Shanghai as you would kind of a woman with a really seedy past, a woman who should be punished. And so Shanghai went from being kind of the Paris of Asia to being more like the San Bernardino of Asia. <laughs> and it pretty much stayed that way, as this kind of gray, depressing place until the mid-1990s when there was this resurgence, this kind of renaissance. And today you could say that Shanghai is once again the Paris of Asia. You could be, might be more accurate to say that it's now the New York of Asia, but it might be most accurate to say that New York is now the Shanghai of the rest of the world. Okay, so in this city, uh, at this very last moment, are two what were called beautiful girls, Pearl and May, a pair of sisters. 
Beautiful girls were models who used to pose for Shanghai advertising. And this advertising took a particular form, posters and calendars. And these advertisements were advertising not just the products that were here in the borders of the uh, poster, but also this idea of a new modern Chinese woman. These were not their mothers or their grandmothers. They didn't have bound feet. They were well educated. They expected to marry for love, not go into arranged marriages. They had this whole bright future ahead of them. And so in these posters that they would pose for, you would see these beautiful girls playing tennis, playing mini golf, shooting bows and arrows, diving into a pool, climbing out of a pool, stepping off of airplanes, waving, <coughs> driving cars, going to nightclubs, drinking champagne, smoking cigarettes, because they were modern and they were advertising themselves as being educated, smart, beautiful, bettable, and also potentially good mothers. I have been collecting this Shanghai advertising for years and years and years. I love it. And I have hanging uh, next to my bed on the left side one of my favorite posters. And it shows two, sis two girls. One is seated, and the other one is kind of posed right over her, to this other woman. And they're just lovely. I mean, they were called beautiful girls for a reason. And if you have a copy of the book in your hands, you can see what they look like. They have these beautiful complexions, really lovely hair. In this particular po poster, they're wearing Western-style dresses with little cinched-in waists. And the fabric is all this kind of art deco pattern. And they're, see they're in this room that's all peach and pink and it's just so lovely you just want to kind of lick them up you know they're just so pretty except for one thing falling down in the room around them are all of these dead bugs and insects because what it's an advertisement for is earth bug and insect spray <laughs> And the one who's seated, the one who's in the chair, just looking, just so pretty. She's holding one of those kind of old fashioned. <laughs> so um, these posters have a lot of humor to them. That's one reason that I like them. Uh, anyway, Pearl and May are the kinds of, of these beautiful girls and living in this Paris of Asia. And just as things start to go south in the city, things take a pretty bad turn for these two sisters who suddenly find themselves on their way to the United States in arranged marriages. Now, we had a lot of arranged marriages in my family. Back in 1932, my great uncle took his family back to China on a buying trip. And you know how dads, you know you're on vacation, and dads will say to the kids, you know, here's a little money, stay out of trouble, go buy a souvenir. My great uncle said, you know, as long as we're here, let's, let's get all you boys wives. And that's what they did. <laughs> the oldest one was 25, the youngest one was only 15. And these young women who in China had had servants, once they came to Los Angeles Chinatown, they really became the servants. And they lived these very closed in, very cut off lives. They truly didn't get out. Uh, only for three occasions, weddings, funerals, and one, what were called one month birthday parties. So these were the aunties that I grew up with. These were the people that were around me all the time when I was a little girl. And there are a couple of them still living today. And this is how closed off things were for them. Here it is 70 years later, and they may speak about 10 words of English. They just didn't get out. OK, so Pearl and May, once they're on this boat, they're coming in these arranged marriages. And their first stop is at Angel Island. Has anyone heard of Angel Island? couple of people. Angel Island was the Ellis Island of the West. Well, we all know Ellis Island. Let's see if I can get this number right. A hundred million Americans, that's one out of three of us, can trace our ancestry or trace being here to ancestors who came through Ellis Island. It was overall a welcoming place. Yes, you had to answer 20 standard questions. Yes, you had to go through the physical exam. Yes, there were moments of 
humiliation and embarrassment, but overall a welcoming place. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 100 million people here uh, who'd come through there eventually. So uh, that was Ellis Island. But Angel Island had a very different purpose. It was seen as the guardian of the Western Gate. It had opened with the sole purpose of keeping the Chinese out. And this had grown out of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which had barred the immigration of all Chinese immigrants except for four categories, people who were ministers, diplomats, students, or merchants. And of those four, there's only one you can fake, that would be a merchant, right? So they were looking for people who were coming over with this false merchant status, paper merchants. They were also looking for what were called paper sons. Paper sons were young men who in China had bought a piece of paper claiming that they were the son of, an, of a Chinese born in the United States, therefore an American citizen. And if you're the son or daughter of an American citizen, you're also automatically the son, or you're also automatically an American citizen. So they would buy this piece of paper claiming false citizenship. So the inspectors at Angel Island were looking for people, these paper merchants, paper sons, their wives, and their children. And so instead of answering a standard 20 questions, as people did at Ellis Island, Chinese immigrants had to answer a anywhere between 200 and 1,000 standard questions. And these weren't easy questions, and just think about these for a second. Just, and these are just some of the easy ones. How many steps from your street to your front door? How many trees in front of your house? How many trees in front of the house three doors down? How many windows in, in the house across the street? These weren't easy questions. They were designed to trick people into making mistakes so that they would be detained and interrogated for weeks, for months, sometimes up to two years before they were deported back to China, committed suicide, or were finally allowed to land in San Francisco. And Pearl and May finally are allowed to land in San Francisco, and they make their way down to Los Angeles. By this time, it's 1938. Well, Los Angeles in 1938 had four Chinatowns. One of them was called China City. Have you, any of you, been to Los Angeles and gone to Alvera Street? No. One person, yay! Okay, so Alvera Street was this creation of a Caucasian woman who had wanted to create an authentic Mexican marketplace. Um, it's still there today, it's a lot of fun, but let me tell you something, it's not terribly authentic, okay? So she also wanted to create this authentic Chinese city. It was one square block, surrounded by a miniature Great Wall, and inside it was built from the leftover sets from the filming of The Good Earth. <laughs> It wasn't terribly authentic, but it did have a lot of charm. And so you could go there and you could ride in a rickshaw down the passage of 100 Surprises. You could nibble on China burgers. You could go to the Chinese junk cafe and drink pirate grog, a not terribly famous Chinese drink. Uh, I actually have a personal connection to China City. Uh, it was an ill-fated place. It had a fire after one year, was rebuilt, had a second fire after 10 years, and then it never reopened again. It closed down. But there was one building that had survived. And it was into that building that my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles moved the family Chinese antique store. And so when I was a little girl, I spent just a tremendous amount of time in this, what was kind of a skeleton, this last little skeleton of China City. And the store was big. Actually, if we were going this way, I would say it was about the size of this room, maybe a little larger. And it had this big central aisle filled with all this Chinese antiques. And along the sides were what had once been the little shops in China City, these little, little storefronts. They had 
little upturned eaves and other architectural, Chinese architectural elements. But now that it was part of our family store, one, was, one room was for bronzes, one was the art room, one was for ceramics, one was for textiles, one for scrolls, one for jewelry. But there were also these other sort of hidden rooms that had, again, these kind of skeletal remains of China's city, the old wishing well, the old goldfish pond. And this was a wonderful place for me as a child. Today, not one single brick of it is there anymore. It has been completely wiped off the map of Los Angeles. In these last few years, I started to realize that very shortly it would be wiped off the map of memory, that there wouldn't be anyone left who would have known about China City. Okay, and then one last piece of history, and then we'll move on to the other stuff. The last piece has to do with the confession program of 1957. This was a program, a government program, targeted very specifically at the Chinese in America. What they were asking, what the government was asking, was for Chinese who had come here as paper sons to step forward, confess, and in exchange they would be given their legal citizenship. It was a kind of an amnesty program. And when you look at it like that as an amnesty program, you think, you know, sign me up. Well, you know, it was the government. So, so there was a little small print in there. And the small print was this. It's not enough for you to step forward and just confess about yourself. You also need to rat out your friends, your neighbors, your business associates, even your own family members, and best of all, if you could say, oh, and by the way, I think he's a communist, for sure you would be given your citizenship. This was something that ripped apart communities, destroyed businesses, wrecked havoc in families. It's something that scholars to this day have written very little about because the people who went through it, whether they had confessed or whether they were ratted out, they still have so much shame, embarrassment, and guilt that they just won't talk about it. But as I said at the very beginning, I am a bit of a pest, and uh, I will sit on your couch for a long, long time. And so I did get people to tell me about their experiences during the confession program. I talked to a woman in Washington, D.C., one of five children born here in the United States, and her father stepped forward to confess. The day he got his citizenship, they came and arrested his wife to deport her back to China because he had told on her. Uh, they fought for eight years to keep her in the country and finally were able to. But you know, 1957, this was not a time that you wanted to be sent back to the People's Republic of China. I talked to a man in Southern California, and he and his brother had stepped forward together. And it was actually a kind of uneventful story. You know, they stepped forward, they went, you know, together, they got their citizenship, but he told me, and here it is, 50 years later, he said, we have never told our children, we have never told our grandchildren what happened then because we aren't dead yet, so we aren't safe yet. So that gives you a little sense of the history that's in this book. But as I said at the very beginning, to me what these stories are about are relationships and emotions. In Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I wrote about best friends for life. In Peony and Love, they're the three sister wives, but also the relationship between Peony and her mother and her grandmother. Well, now I've written about um, sisters. Now, sisters and siblings in general, this is typically the longest relationship that we'll have in our lifetimes. Your sister is someone who has known you your whole life, who should stand by you and support you and love you no matter what, and yet, there's some sisters here. They're like putting a nice arm around each other. Okay. Yeah. Because actually, you know, it's also your sister who knows exactly where to drive the knife to hurt you the most. I'm sure that's happened, right? So, I am a sister myself. I have actually spent most of my life thinking of myself as an only child. <laughs> I am the only child of my mother and father, but I have a former stepsister 
who uh, I've now known for 50 years. Catherine, she lives in Australia. I can trash talk about her because, you know, if I've never been to Iowa, I'm pretty sure she's not going to get here uh, from, from Australia. I have a half-sister that's my father's daughter and a half-sister who's my mother's daughter. Now, you know, in every family, you know that this is true, that there are certain things we all come to decide, which is kind of labels that we put out there. There's the tall one and the short one, the skinny one and the one we say, oh, she's short-waisted. <laughs> The smart one and the one we say, oh, she's so sweet. <laughs> that was me. She's so sweet, meaning I couldn't add. I couldn't subtract. I still can't. Multiplication, forget it. You know, but I'm very sweet uh, in the family. There's the responsible one, the irresponsible one, the greedy one, the generous one, the troublemaker, the peacemaker, the athletic one. We did not have one of those in our family. Uh, the athletic one, the couch potato, the one who's mom's favorite, you know, the one who's dad's favorite. Well, some of these things are true, but a lot of them, they're just things we've kind of made up in our minds, you know, that we just sort of made it up, but we kind of, and we all kind of go along with it. So I, you know, have been thinking about this now for a couple of years, and I uh, talk to a lot of groups like this around the country, but I also join a lot of book clubs by speakerphone. They write to me and you know, through my website and say, you know, will you join in our speak book club? And I say, sure, call me at this time, and then we do it. And um, often people would say, you know, what are you working on now? I'm working on a book on sisters, or do you have any questions for us? And I say, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> Is there something your sister could do that would cause an irrevocable break? And I always got the exact same answer. Yes, if she slept with my husband. <laughs> but here's the thing. Coming through the line later, people would say, let me, I need to, I didn't want to say it in front of everyone else, but let me tell you what my sister did. Or they, I get an email a couple of days later. You know, I didn't want to say anything in front of all my girlfriends, but let me tell you, and then this long email <laughs> of all the things a sister had done. Because it turns out that sleeping with your husband, that is the least of it. <laughs> so, so I have talked to women who haven't talked to their sisters in two years, 10 years, 20 years, one woman, 40 years. And I said to her, um, well, you know, after 40 years, aren't you just kind of done with her? I mean, you don't have to even think about it anymore, her anymore, do you? And she said, oh, no, no, because, you know, sisters are for life. Well, they are. And, uh, you know, I have been asking people when they come through the, the you know, uh, line to get their books signed, I'll say, do you have a sister? And um, sometimes I'll say yes, and I'll say, would you like me to make it out to the two of you? <laughs> no, no. Um, sometimes a woman will come through, you know, someone will come through with a whole stack of books. I want one for all of my sisters, except for Margie. <laughs> We're not talking to her right now. Okay, so anyway, sometimes I'll say, yes, I have a sister, and, and, you know, make this out to Estelle. And I'll say, remember, sisters are for life, what that woman told me. And, you know, by now, I don't know if it's a blessing or like a life sentence, you know. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so thinking about sisters and thinking about that question, was there something that a sister could do that would cause an irrevocable break sort of made me think about something else, which I also started asking people about. What's the difference between actual sisters and friends who are just like sisters? What I call sisters of the heart. These women that we choose to be our sisters. These women that we choose to bring into our hearts and who bring us into their hearts. And how is that different from actual sisters? Now, I have a little post-it here. My sister gave it to me after I gave my first talk about the book in Los Angeles five weeks ago. And she didn't like it that we were, you know, this is Clara. Uh, she didn't like it that um, people were coming up to her at the book event and saying, which one are you? 
Pearl, or May. And I had to when I had to make sure to say that none of my sisters are in this book. And really, it's true. They aren't. This is not a story. It's not an autobiographical story of my, my dysfunctional sisters. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Clara is one of the few people, I have about five people, who will read my books in manuscript form. And there were several places in the manuscript where she wrote in the margins, oh, way to get back at Catherine. <laughs> And then we started the tour. And the first stop was to what we call the first family store. My great-grandfather had four wives, two families. The first family was Fong Si, my great-grandfather, and a woman, Ticey Pruitt, who has, her family had come out west on the Oregon Trail and settled in Oregon, a Caucasian woman. That's why I look like this, OK? <laughs> so that's the first family. When he was in his 60s, Fong Si went back to China on a buying trip, and while he, you know, he bought stuff, but while he was there, he, uh, he came back with a 16-year-old bride. <laughs> and they went on to have another seven children. The last was born when he was in his 90s. I see there aren't too many men here tonight, but this should give you something to aspire to. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, that is the, what we call the second family. And so it was to the second family store. That was our first stop. And that store has long, long, long been run by the eldest son in that family. But he had died about three months earlier. And now his youngest brother is running the store. And at that time, he was 78. And I just had this like little momentary thought, just like, boom, right across my brain of, you know, this could be gone in five years. And then we walked down Chungking Way to Fong's gift shop. Fong's gift shop was the store that had been started by my great uncle, the one who went back to China and came back with the wives. And that store had long, 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 long been run by the youngest son in that family. But Uncle Gim had died about two years earlier. And now his oldest brother is running the store. And Akhern this year turned 98. And I thought, well, you know, for sure this is going to be gone in five years. And then we all piled into the car and we drove out to Pasadena where the first family store, the st store that I'm descended from is. And this is the store that used to be in that skeleton of China City. But about 30 years ago, they, it moved out to Pasadena. And as I said, it's, it's, a, it's big. It's really big. And I have a kind of standard tour that I give there. There's first the big marriage bed, and then the big temple carvings. My great-grandparents had a really interesting way of doing business. They used to go into villages in China, and they'd say things like, you know, we like your temple. We'll buy it. And they'd buy it and take it apart, ship it back to LA, put it back together where they would go into phase two of their business plan. Never sell anything. <laughs> so all this stuff is still there. You know, it's just all there. So, so first the big marriage bed, then the temple carvings, and then we went into the art room. And in the art room, I've always talked about my great-grandmother's dowry table. And this is the table that the whole fam the first family, when everyone was happy, when everyone was together, that this was where they had all had their meals around this table. And it was gone. And my cousin, who has long run that store, has always said, Grandma's dowry table will be the last thing I sell before I close the store. In fact, it was the first of the major pieces. These women from Fairfield, I have to tell you, they were having a wonderful time, but I was just devastated. Because in this couple of hours, I realized that all of the people and all of the places who have made me who I am, the people who have loved me unconditionally, the people who have given me their stories, that all of them are going to be gone in a couple of years. 
Now, I know I'm not the only one that happens to. I know it happens to all of us. If it hasn't started happening to you yet, don't worry, it's coming. I was uh, giving a talk in Capitola, California, not too long ago, and there was a woman in the audience by the name of Winky, such a cheerful name, who called out, yeah, and it's not going to get any better. <laughs> and you know, the thing is, it's not going to be get any better. I've been gone for five weeks, and in the five weeks I've been gone, two more of my relatives have died. So it's not going to get any better, and it is going to disappear. And so the heart of this novel really is that, that sense of loss that we all feel for the people and places who made us who we are. And that's the heart of it. Just before I left on the tour, I was doing some research on Ming Dynasty artists. And I came across a quote from one of them who said, art is the heartbeat of the artist. And I've really been thinking about that. And I, I think that my words, these words that I write, they are my heartbeat. And this book is the one that's the closest to my heart, and I hope it speaks to your hearts as well. Thank you. Like Lisa mentioned, is the, the really this book is the closest to her heart. Heart. What does she describe? Not only bound the foot, uh, feet, and also the arranged marriage. I forgot to tell you about that uh, because my parents' marriage was uh, arranged marriage. They did not uh, see each other until the day they engaged. And. Uh, and also talk about a, a half a sisters, a half a brother, and I just took a trip, a two and a half weeks trip to China and Taiwan, and I met my half a brother in southern China, and met uh, uh, the other uh, half, the other half a sister in in Taiwan. Uh, half a brother was in southern China, and a half a sister was in Taiwan. So it's a, and uh, certainly our parents uh, were long gone and uh, we are just trying to get to know each other. So I understand what uh, you are dealing with, uh, yeah. And uh, since, uh, well, I actually talked a lot about uh, uh, your family and also the Shanghai girls, uh, and I still wanted to, to ask this question, how close is of uh, this book, uh, retelling of your family's uh, stories? Well, I, actually, I don't really think of this book as a retelling of my family's story. I, you're holding the book that's a retelling of my family's story. I hardly ever see that original hardcover anymore. Um, but I wrote that book. It's called On Gold Mountain, and that's a very, very different kind of story. Um, you know, when you write nonfiction and you're writing about your own family, you'd better stick with the absolute facts of what happened to them. <laughs> or they're gonna come after you, you know? So um, one of the nice things about fiction is that you can put people in different kinds of situations. Um, you know, it's all very true to the history of the period, but you also have a way to um, get into their emotions and, and their experiences. And what I love about fiction and I mean, this for me, just as a reader, what I love is when you open up the pages and you step into this other world and you connect to these characters, you think about your own life, you think about your own experiences. Really what you're doing is you're, through these characters, connecting to the human condition. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions from audience? You better get working on those cards. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, your question is uh, related to Shanghai Girl. Does Pearl find a joy in China? You'll have to read the sequel. <laughs> I am working on it. Um, I, I've done all of the research. I've gone to China. I just was in China in April, and I did the research there. And I've you know, pretty much done all the research. And as soon as the tour is done, and 
I catch up with my mail and I make up with my husband uh, who hasn't <laughs> seen me in a while, um, then I will start writing, uh, writing it. It'll be out in about two years. Do you speak uh, uh, Chinese? Do I speak or Chinese? Asians? I grew oh, up in a Cantonese-speaking family, and I can understand some food. You know, just put me down, <laughs> down for food. Um, I studied Mandarin for a while, and I got, you know, I got pretty good. I, but the thing is, the minute I stopped studying, it went right out of my head. When I go to China, in the big cities, I, you don't really need to have an interpreter. Everyone speaks English, but. I, most of the time when I'm there, I'm, I'm out in the interior. You know, I'm really out in these small, small villages. How many of you have read Snowflower and the Secret Fan? Okay, so <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought that might be so. Wow. So uh, when I went to do the research for that, I was told I was only the second foreigner to go to that part of China, uh, to Jianyong County in southwestern Hunan province. And I, by my count, I was actually the fifth, but I was only the ca second Caucasian-looking foreigner. And I hired someone who spoke the Hunan dialect. But because it was a closed area of China, I also had to travel with someone who was like the vice mayor. And it was a good thing we had him with us because we were walking from village to village. These were, you know, a half a mile, a mile apart. What is that, a 10 minute, a 20 minute walk? Even today, the dialect changes. And so the Chinese, it, you know, whether it's Mandarin or Cantonese or the Wu dialect or any of these little tiny, tiny dialects all throughout China, the written language is standard. And so we spend a lot of time in these conversations just writing on our palms with our fingers. Do you mean this character or this character? And that's something that you see all over China uh, today, especially now that the society is much more fluid. And then just finally, I'll just say that in April when I went to China, um, a friend of mine who's a writer said, you know, I have to do some research to Amy Tan. She said, I have to do some research, you know, in China. Shall we go together? And I've always done my research trips by myself, but I thought, sure, this will be fun. Amy and I are really good friends. And uh, you know how Amy always writes about her sisters? So she has sisters in Shanghai, and there was one night when we all, she, they, she was going to have a family dinner. She said, oh, do you want to come? I was like, sure, I'll come, you know, dinner with Amy and her sisters. How fun will that be? <laughs> well, two of the sisters weren't talking to the other sister. <laughs> and it was so funny to see, like, another family acting out, right? <laughs> but anyway, Amy said, let's have Jindo. We were, so we went to Shanghai and Beijing at the end, and in the middle, we went to this small village of about 300 people where we'd been invited to stay in a 17th century villa with 29 bedrooms. Doesn't that sound great? Okay, let me just tell you something. A 17th century villa in rural China is not the same thing as in Tuscany. <laughs> You know, no hot water, no heat, no indoor plumbing. But anyway, it was great. So um, it was only 250 miles from Shanghai. And so Amy said, let's take Jindo. She can be our translator. This will be great. And I, I was like, yeah, OK, let's take Jindo. But I want to have my own translator in the village. And she says, no, no, no. Jindo will know everything. This is going to be perfect. And Jindo will be completely in charge of this. And we don't have to worry. And we don't have to spend the extra $10 a day. And I was like, fine, fine, but I'm going to spend the extra $10 a day. Well, Jindo, we went 250 miles, and she did not understand a single word, not one word. This is just 250 miles from Shanghai. That's, I mean, it's like a completely different language. So um, you, ha you know, I always have someone who speaks the very, very local dialect. That was a very long answer. I'm sorry. No, well, that's OK. Yeah, just for your information, there are more than 4,000 dialects in yeah. China. So maybe across the river, across the bridge, that's another dialect. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we had experience in Hong Kong, I, since I don't speak Cantonese, so I had to communicate with uh, taxi drivers uh, in writing. Yeah. <laughs> so how long does it take uh, you to research a book, including travel and so on? Well, I don't really know how to answer that question because either it takes two years from the moment I say, okay, this is the book I'm going to write, um, but usually there's an idea that I've been thinking about for quite a while. 
sometimes, you know, five years, ten years before, there, there's always something, like I don't know how to tell it, or I don't know if I'm ready, or I, there's one idea I've had for now a long time, but I don't think I'm mature enough. It's like ridiculous since I'm 54. I don't know what I'm waiting for, but <laughs> I don't. I don't think I'm there yet. I just I need a you know a little more work on the tires or whatever. Um, so you know. So is it two years? Is it that five to ten years? Or really, is it my whole life? Because I I actually for each book I sort of put in. Every, I think I put in everything I know right up to today. And uh, one, of, one of the nice things that happened with uh, the success, I uh, came out of the success of Snowflower and the Secret Fan, was that my publisher went back and reprinted books that had long been out of print. And uh, they came in the mail. And I don't read my books again. You know, I didn't do a reading here, and I don't do a readings. I don't really like that. So once I'm done, that's it. I don't really go back and read it. But these books came in the mail, and they had these really gorgeous jackets. And you know, if they'd had those jackets to begin with, more people would have read them. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I was like, oh, this is nice. And so I, I was kind of flipping through, kind of looking at them. And here's the thing. I actually, there were scenes I didn't remember writing. Whole characters, I didn't know who they were. Um, I just, it was like, I wrote that? I mean, I really, I really didn't remember those um, stories too well, but what I did remember, and it didn't matter what page I opened to, I remembered exactly where I was emotionally. Like, oh God, that day I was so mad at my husband. You know, or oh, my son, his, you know, his teacher was giving him all that trouble and he was so depressed. Oh, then when that girl broke up with him, I mean, I could remember just exactly so. In a way, they're, they're kind of, um, they're like a landscape of my emotional state over many, many years. Uh, but, you know, again, it's like what you know when you're a mother when you have a two-year-old is very different than what you know when you're a mother of a 25-year-old. Right? So, you know, that's what I mean. I'm sort of putting in what I, and, you know, when you look, how you look at your mother when you're a teenager is very different from how you look at your mon mother when she starts to ail and become frail. So, it, that, it, that's all just part of, uh, you know, but it takes a lifetime to put all of that in. So, two years, 10 years, 54 years. So, when you, when you I mean, are you working on currently working on another book? Yeah, it's a sequel. A sequel. Yeah. Uh, still about to those two sisters. Yeah. And what's going to happen to Joy? The first question that we had. <laughs> and uh, also there, the, there's a question once in there you know, cover two girls. Which one is May? Which one is Pearl? Well, I think that's for other people to figure out. But I know who I think they are. I think this one's Pearl and this one's May. Yeah. Yeah. See. Yeah. Yeah. We all agree. That's right. <laughs> Okay, and uh, here also want to talk about. Uh, can you talk about uh, your? You talk about uh, your sisters. Uh, can you talk about your parents? Are they all Chinese descendants? Um, so my parents. Well, my father is from the Chinese side, and my mother is not. And uh, uh, I don't know what about him. My mother's a writer, Carolyn C. My father was an anthropologist. They were married for about two minutes, actually three years. Uh, so not very long, not very long. But you know, they still are great friends. And the Chinese side of the family treats my mother as the you know sort of honored first wife. Um, and all the other wives that just have to suck it up, you know. <laughs> they really don't like it, but that's how it is. <laughs> And sometimes my husband said, well, a, he would like to have more women. I said, that's okay with me, as long as I have control with all the money. <laughs> yeah. And they can do all the housework, yada work. <laughs> okay, here's another question. Um, here, we'd like to know, can you tell us more about your primary family? Well, we just had that question. Yeah, what, more, right. what, what more would you like to know? Uh, how they came here? How I ended looking like this? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Now I just I so we're about. getting yeah. a couple of those. So I was thinking, are you talk all just too discreet to ask what you really want to? Oh, talk okay, about so your my great great grandfather. Uh, I just want to start this by saying that on my mother's side of the family, they landed here in in 1610. Okay. So um, that that's just to show that. I have some roots, okay. But, but my great great grandfather was the first person uh, to, from the Chinese side to come to this country. He came to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. I like to think of this man as one of the original deadbeat dads. You were supposed to come here, work hard, save up your money, and send it back home to China. Not my great great grandfather. He had a fondness for women and gambling. Something I'm sorry to say continues in our family even today. And as a result, his wife, my great-great-grandmother, used to carry people on her back from village to village to earn money to support her children. Finally, some people took pity on her and lent my great-grandfather the money to come to the United States, what the Chinese called the Gold Mountain. And by this time, he was 14 years old. Uh, and by this time, the railroad was completed. He found his father working in Sacramento. He said, I'm just I'm thinking about what's coming. <laughs> and I've never said it in Iowa before. OK. <laughs> OK, so he uh, was 14. He came. He found his father working in Sacramento. He said, you know, Dad, you're a bum. Go home. And he did. And my great-grandfather stayed. And he did a lot of the jobs that immigrants do even today. He washed dishes in restaurants. He swept up in factories. He worked in the fields. But by the time he was 30, he had his first business in Sacramento. Uh, it was in the 1880s. It was a factory that manufactured crotchless underwear for brothels. <laughs> shop came a young woman who I think of as being quintessentially American. Uh, Ticey's family had come out west on the Oregon Trail in a covered wagon. They'd settled in Oregon, homesteaded there. We know a lot more about what that American pioneer life was like and how hard it was, especially for women. Her mother died when she was a baby. Her father died when she was seven. And she was raised by brothers who were reputed to be quite cruel to her. She ran away from home when she turned 18. She couldn't afford San Francisco. She ended up in Sacramento. And it wasn't like it is today. You know, you're a young woman on your own. Worst comes to worst, you could go work at a Walmart or 7-Eleven, McDonald's, but no one would hire her. I know she had one option for a job. As far as I know, she didn't take it. But she did end up in Chinatown begging my great-grandfather for a job and he hired her to sell what we call in our family fancy underwear for fancy ladies. <laughs> um, one thing led to another and they decided to get married. But I use that term very loosely because in California it was against the law for Chinese and Caucasians to marry until 1948. Chinese down to just a quarter. In many of the other western states, 28 other states, uh, but most of them in the west, the laws stayed on the books till 1965. Uh, against the law in California for Chinese, also down to a quarter to own property in the state till 1948, and against the law at the federal level for Chinese to become naturalized citizens until 1943. So what these two people did was they went to a lawyer who drew up a contract between two people as though they were forming a partnership. And um, eventually they moved down to Los Angeles, stayed in the underwear business for a while, gradually into curios, and finally into antiques, that store that's still in business today. But and, then, and then, you know, there are other things. He was the first... <laughs> He was the first Chinese in America to own an automobile, and he used to sell tickets to see his stuffed mermaid. And, you know, and then he did, back in 1919, go back to China when he was in his 60s and come back with that 16-year-old girl. And so then the two wives lived, lived across the street from each other for the, for the rest of Ticey's life. But the properties were under... But all the properties property. were under his name, yeah. yeah. 
under his name or her well, name? Well, some were under, yeah, because they were under her name because he couldn't own them. But, yeah, that's why he started that second store. And here, so how long did, uh, did it take you to research and write uh, on Gold Mountain? Now, to write, research and write on Gold Mountain was five years from when I decided to work on it. Um, you know, but again, that's one that really was my whole life. But five years from the moment I decided. Is there another uh, period in the history you would like to write about? In China? In China or, or anywhere? anywhere? Um, yeah, a lot. But I don't know in particular. I mean, I, I have, um, you know, I have these ideas, other ideas, probably about ten of them that I've been thinking about now for a few years. And some, you know, and I'll look at them. Like, I, they're like little yellow post-its. I guess I'm a big fan of the yellow post-its. So I have these, you know, things, and I sort of pull them out and look at them. And, and uh, sometimes, yeah, I, you know, I, yes. There are others. <laughs> <laughs> no, we cannot wait for the, the Shanghai Girls sequel. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much.